So today we're going to be talking a little bit about foodscaping um, among the flower beds. So this is going to be incorporating a little bit of edible landscaping. So what is foodscaping? Um, this is a modern term for the integration of edible plants that allows you to grow food alongside your flowers. But this strategy can be aesthetically pleasing to the landscape. Um, I did some of my grad school research on a water efficiency study on culinary herbs grown on the green roof above our soil and science building at SIU at Carbondale. The, the idea really is maximizing our space to grow edibles and has been an interest of mine for the past few recent years. Um, so today I'm just going to explain a little bit on how you can use space and have an increase in your food production. When we think about it, um, edible landscaping is the use of food producing plants in landscapes. It combines fruit and nut trees, berry bushes, vegetables, herbs, edible flowers, alongside with ornamental plants. Many of our edible plants can be just as attractive to our ornamental plants as and add like the benefit of having fresh produce alongside it. So it's really a dual purpose. So when we look at benefits, we can think that, you know, this is an increase in healthier food options. We can have fresh produce right outside our door. Uh, we can lower our grocery budget by adding some locally grown vegetables or fruits. I mean, we're talking as far as being able to share with our neighbors and have things right outside our doorstep. Um, we can increase our biodiversity in the landscape. We know that flowers attract pollinators. Um, they increase aesthetic appeal uh, for our landscapes and we can increase our food security. Um, when we think about this, we know that we've seen food prices lately According to the USDA Food Price Index in 2023, food prices have increased by 5.8%. Uh, food price growth slowed a little bit as inflation started. And so we know that this could be a measure that we could take for our own families to help with that food security and having things um, grown locally. The other big thing is... you. When we think about how can we add plants and things to our landscape, it's really for our physical and mental health. We have advantages. Um, we have our opportunity for our families to engage in um, gardening activities. We This helps to decrease some of our stress and tension. I know if I'm outside, it, it helps with my stress levels. It increases our exercise, just getting out and moving and standing up and down. Um, it enhances our mood. Hopefully it, it makes you happy as it does me to see those um, nature and, and all the elements out there. If it's a bee coming through to visit or a butterfly, but it also increases our, our awareness that what we put it into our surroundings really does affect us. We also can think about what can be some of our benefits? Um, researchers have conducted um, lots of studies and one study in Australian Institute says that 71% of surveyed households incorporate edibles into their gardens, um, primarily for the purpose of having access to fresh, healthier produce. So we know that that is one of the benefits. If we have homegrown vegetables and fruits, we have an advantage over our counterparts by them being harvested and consumed sooner than maybe what was brought into the supermarket. Um, so this is a common motivation behind adding foodscaping to our landscapes. That desire to grow, cook, and consume foods of high nutritious content. So when we look at this, this is our average landscape that might be around our household. And when we're looking at this, we know that the average landscape is about 1,250 square foot, which really is equivalent to almost 48 standard four by eight raised beds. If we think about foodscaping and how we can capture some of that potential space, 
to grow our vegetables and fruit, um, we have this option maybe already scaled in that we have this beautiful, open, sunny, prime spot that's mulched already, right? So we have the basis that we may not have to build new beds, but actually capture some of the space we already have. And this is a great way that we can do it. And just looking at the landscaping. So really the aim of foodscaping, um, the design that we want to think about is making the most of the cultivated land while utilizing some of these existing shrubs and baseline. We know just like planning any other landscape, it starts with a plan. Um, we know that we have to keep in mind that fruits and vegetables require full sun conditions. So that might not be your location, right? We need to look at our location of our house and how it's set next to our neighbor. How is the sun oriented? But when we think about that, we know that even though they require full sun, some of the leafy greens like lettuce and kale can tolerate more shade. We also know that other plants in our landscapes can uh, reach maturity um, a, way before some of our smaller plants, which allows us time to incorporate some of those edible plants. Uh, they have a little bit of a different care when we think about our ornamentals that are going in. Um, we know that the fertilizer requirements might be a different. We know that um, they may need some pruning to happen to make sure they're staying in shape. So when we're looking at this, we know that edible plants can be incorporated into our um, ornamental planting. We just have to make sure that we're keeping in mind all the requirements that we're going to need to be successful with this planting. The other thing that you might question is, is are we allowed to do this if we have an HOA or we have um, a landscaping area in uh, the state of Illinois? This is the Gardening Act um, that allows for you to produce and uh, consume food that is in your landscaping. So this is just a way for you to check and you're able to look this up. This is the right that Illinois residents do have to incorporate edibles. When we look at our space, not everyone has the same space, right? I am fortunate enough to have a space for a traditional garden setting. You might have a space that's a community garden or a very sunny location that you can have a more traditional or raised bed area. But everyone's space looks a little different. And we need to think about um, how can we still incorporate these edibles into a non-traditional garden space. How we can do this is looking at the space that you have and the design that you want to try to incorporate. We need to think about the zones of our landscape. Um, when we think about we're looking at this, we we're looking at what are the three zones that we might be near our house. So if we look at the zone one, as I'm going to put in here, it's really those zones that are items planted closer to maybe your road or driveway or further from the house. These are where you know you're not going to have the water source. So you're wanting to look at planting more of that 80% ornamentals or trees and only 20% of your edibles. Because of this lack of water source and possibly um, higher maintenance, we want to have those less amount of edibles, you know, furthest away from our house, just because of having that requirements of more maintenance. The second zone we want to think about is almost the mid yard. Some of us might have little islands, uh, very much like this second picture here um, by the gazebo. These little island breaks that we might already have little berms or ornamentals planted. At that midpoint in our yard where we have a better water source, we can now incorporate 40% edibles to our 60% ornamentals. Because of the fact that we have a better chance of watering them, we have a, a higher uh, rate of managing them. If they start to get a little out of control or they need pruning or they need to be harvested, in mid yard, we know that that's a better place for us to be able to incorporate more edibles. 
That third zone, which is right up next to our house, right? This is where we're going to have a lot of our access uh, next to the house. We know that the that it's a greater uh, indication of a water source to be there. We also know that we want to step right outside of our house and be able to harvest those everyday edibles. That's where we're going to want to incorporate our herbs, any of our leafy greens, kales, um, anything to make salads or that we're going to be harvesting uh, very quickly to be able to incorporate into our uh, garden um, vegetables or any of our cooking elements. We know that we can put up to 50% of our edibles right along the base of our house and still be very successful with them. But when we're evaluating our space, we need to think about, do we have proper soil management? Um, when we're thinking, if we need a soil test, that's always key to knowing what plants are going to thrive. If we have acidic soil um, considerations up next to the house, we know that we're going to need to amend that soil. We know that some of our vegetables are not going to tolerate that. We might be able to have other plants that will tolerate it, but we need to think about what is that soil management? Uh, do we have um, any of those mulching elements that might need to be pulled away a little bit? If there's rocks that's been incorporated, maybe we want to go to a more um, organic mulch area in that little place we're going to add our edibles. The use of interplanting um, with our edibles is another way that we can do it. If we interplant and succession plant lettuces and kales and herbs, we might be able to incorporate more of those um, into that by succession planting, opposed to having them scattered throughout the whole landscape, we might want a succession plant. The second thing we need to think about um, could be our fertilizer management for edibles and ornamentals. We know that ornamentals um, so we'll use slow-release slow fertilizers, and they might work a little bit better in some situations. We might have to change our methods if we're going to add edibles that need a little more of that kickstart and more of a um, water-soluble-based fertilizer. So as we're thinking about that, we really need to keep those into consideration. The other thing is, you know, if we're if we're struggling this first year and we don't know if we're going to be able to manage it, using containers might be another alternative method. We might be able to add some of the containers and actually put those down in between our edibles and um, in between our ornamentals in our landscaping, add a mulch layer up to the top of the container, not covering our plant, but up to it, kind of cover the base of our containers a little bit and incorporated the first year to see if this is a trial and error, error way to do it. We also can put vertical elements into our landscapes by having these containers where we can put some trellised areas. We know we really love to incorporate a lot of things into our space. If you're like me, uh, I like to add a little bit of everything and that isn't always the best practice in some in some situations, right? Um, we need to think about if we're evaluating our space and we really want to incorporate a fruit tree, we need to think what is the best place for this tree? Um, can we incorporate this in the spring of the year and um, or should we incorporate this in the fall of the year? Um, is an apple a better option uh, with limited space because we can get the that dwarf rootstock? That might be an alternative to possibly a regular uh, large fruit tree in the middle of our yard or close to our house. So when we're thinking about it, you can see this photo, and this photo is showing a lot of fruited dwarfed uh, fruit uh, apples on here. The problem is, is that it's lacking the support structure that it needs. So if we're going to do this and incorporate it into our landscaping, we might want to think about how can we support this with some additional trellising um, or additional support elements. It might be that we need to plant an additional tree next to it for additional support. We also can think about 
can we incorporate, if we do have a little bit of shade, is it a native persimmon? Is that a better choice? Or a pawpaw uh, grove opposed to an apple grove? What might be an option for us to have fresh fruit, but have the limited space that we have? If we are really wanting to incorporate and do more of that food forest, we might be looking at wanting a nut tree. But we need to think about in that space, walnuts and pecans can grow as large as 50 foot, right? And um, they provide a lot of shade. Is this what we want to incorporate into our landscaping? And is this going to get be the most optimal thing that we're going to have? Because we know it's going to take us multiple years before we can actually harvest that produce. Um, so is this really what we want to spend our time on? So really thinking about all this prior to planting will set you up for the greatest success that you would have. We also want to think about interplanting um, some of these existing items. If we have some of our flowers already established and they're perennial flowers, can we just add some herbs or additional grasses like lemongrass or uh, to our fl existing flower beds. We know that this is going to increase the biodiversity and seasonal interest, but are we going to also hinder some of our growth of our perennials? Um, this is something to think about. You know, this could be a disadvantage if we are packing everything too close and we start to see a disease issue. So really thinking about what is the full maturity size of our items that we're planting as we're doing intercropping will lead to the most success. For instance, if you look at this picture, we have some marigolds that are great, but you can see that this purple ruffle basil has really not been pruned. So if you're not going to manage it and prune it back to make it a little smaller and shrubbier, you can see it's going to kind of bush out. It's going to go to bolting and flowering, which is great for our, our biodiversity, but not so great on harvest um, of that product. So we need to think about what is the full maturity size. We also have to think about those woody roots. If we have perennials, they could interfere with our new planting, um, getting them really established and growing well. So we need to think about how are we going to interplant and what spacings are we going to use? The other thing we can think about is we can incorporate a lot of our culinary grasses in with our traditional uh, fountain grasses or any of our other perennial grasses that we have. Lemongrass is a great example of that. It, in Southern Illinois, it doesn't survive our winter time, but it can be harvested. It gets the maturity. It has a beautiful uh, color to it and the citrusy smell that can be utilized. And then it can also, it will, it will go ahead and die back for the winter and then it can be replaced. So as your other um, landscaping becomes established, this is something that you can interchange throughout, but it gives a beautiful color to it. The other thing we want to think about is our fertilizer management. If we're taking fertilizers and incorporating uh, in our, say we're doing a water-soluble fertilizer, then we need to be careful because we know that some of our perennials will really take that and, and run with it, right? We know that they're going, they're used to more of a slow-release fertilizer. So if we're adding that, we know we're going to have exponential growth. That is great for our edibles because we know that they need that. But herbs we know don't necessarily need as much soluble fertilizer being applied. So this is one that we can incorporate around the, that slow release ornamentals and not give excess fertilizer to. We're, we're able to limit that and, and just use what we need to for that. I will say if you are wanting to incorporate possibly um, some sweet corn as a, 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 a long behind a, an area or possibly some Indian corn or popcorn, we do need to think about adding some side dress nitrogen um, to that. That's going to be one where we can add it alongside and not necessarily have to incorporate throughout the whole bed. 
So think about those considerations as you're planting and putting crops next to other crops. What are going to be the requirements? So this is a great one for some ideas, right? We want to think about this is great telling us so we can incorporate it, but what can we incorporate together? So one landscape plant that we commonly can use is our roses. Um, they have edible petals. They have um, rose hips that can provide color in your winter and your fall for interest. Uh, we can incorporate ornamental peppers in with our existing flower beds. We can use purple ruffle or cinnamon basil. We can use our sweet basil. All of these things can are edibles that can be incorporated next to our flowers and really not see any issues um, or hindrance to our flowers that are already established. An edible shrub that we can utilize is our blueberry. Um, when we're looking at elderberries or raspberries, we know that these can create some hedges and screens, but there are certain types like this one right here, this Elliot blueberry um, that has this beautiful fall interest color, but also produces uh, blue, edible blueberries that can be harvested. It's a little bit shorter structure on a blueberry and it can be right along uh, with your flower beds and foundation plantings and still have a beautiful interest with it. We also need to think, what are we putting next to each other? Um, this limelight hydrangea is an established plant. As you can see, it's pretty fierce and, and it's pretty big right now. But this also can be utilized to support maybe some of our tomatoes and um, pole beans or trellising, possibly even like cucumbers stand next to it. So we can we know it's going to be beautiful and it's going to go ahead and, and bloom in the fall. But throughout the season, as it's growing, we can incorporate these tomatoes right next to it. It's a good companion plant. And it also provides that structure for wind issues and any of that for our edibles that we're incorporating. Vining plants um, can also be incorporated. You know, we can look at trellises. Um, this one is got grapes on a trellis, but we can also think about raspberries. Um, golden raspberries can be incorporated on a trellis. Uh, we can utilize an arbor. This one right here is actually a cattle panel arbor um, that has loofahs planted on it. So we can add up maybe a hardy kiwi, things like this that can actually be elements that can be incorporated into our landscaping by just adding those trellises or those fencing elements as we're moving along. Another plant that you can think about mostly what a lot of times we think about as a spring addition um, to our landscaping or our edibles to harvest asparagus plant. We forget sometimes that they make these beautiful uh, ferns um, as they kind of grow throughout the season. Um, they get to be large and they can actually be a backdrop uh, for our flowers as they're in bloom. They can also be a hedge or a screening element. Um, they typically lean, lean over a little bit. So you're going to have to watch as far as trellising anything with them. But they're beautiful accent one that kind of be incorporated right in along your landscaping. One that I really like to use, and I think everyone as we start out as a beginner, strawberries and nasturtiums are great for kids and, and especially to bring them into the garden and have them have instant gratification. I would say this is a great one to add if you haven't before. Um, strawberries, uh, if you're going to use those ever bearing strawberries to have throughout the season. Um, nasturtiums, they have edible flowers and leaves uh, that everyone can enjoy. They can garnish salads. I will tell you, every time I go out to the community garden and I have the opportunity to have a, a young child to come with me and, and try a edible flower like the nasturtium, they enjoy it. They're, they have variegated colors. They have multiple colors that you can, can plant and, and utilize. 
But this is one that they can actually pick. A lot of times we tell them, leave everything, don't harvest yet. But this is one that they can actually harvest and enjoy right there on the spot. Um, we know that if we incorporate things like herbs, mints, thyme, uh, all of these can be used as a ground cover and will spread. We know that thyme, especially lemon thyme or your uh, woolly thyme, can be used and be walkable um, elements that you can walk on. We also want to think about using borage, bachelor buttons. Um, they do have dandelions now that I've seen that aren't uh, just yellow, but they have a white variety of dandelions. Uh, they have pansies and violas that can be used, beautiful colored eggplants, and even Swiss chard, as in the above picture here, the bright light series can be utilized um, in within our flower beds. So there's lots of options that you can have um, to utilize that color and that foliage element in your in your existing landscape. Another great one I like to use for ground cover um, can also be either laying it out um, will be your red scarlet runner beans. They can be they be on the ground, but they also can be trellised up. Um, cucumbers we know the little mini ones and even the cucumber melons can have be runners and can become a ground cover um, along things. We, we know that we can use peas. Um, they can kind of spread out and be utilized in lots of different avenues and aspects of your garden or uh, existing landscape. When we're thinking about what we're gonna incorporate, we go, oh, well, it's already August, right? I may not want to incorporate anything this year but you still have time. We know there's warm season crops that are already going right now, but we're going into this cool season crops and those can be planted close to the house. Um, they can be easily harvested. We know that if we plant lettuce or those cold season crops like our uh, broccolis, our cabbage, our kales, all of those can go into fall and have a harvested season. Um, they can be planted close to the house in, in that layer right next to the house and can be harvested um, all the way up until our frost hits us. This is one. Um, we learned about this plant. It's a juji berries um, and it grows anywhere from our plant hardiness zones from five to nine. So this is going to cover most of our state area that we have. Um, we know that this is a, a better to be in a, as a container plant, but you can see that it had multiple harvests. There's lots of berries on it um, and they can be utilized in that container or a patio setting next to the house. So this is one we're going to find where we have some peppers that have been incorporated into a traditional, just a container setting um, in front of the house. We can kind of see we have some ornamental peppers hidden here. And as we kind of go through the pictures, you're going to see right here in the center picture, you're going to see where the pepper is. We have some uh, coleuses, some uh, coxcomb that's here. We have some trellised um, elements that are, are clematis. And we have some trellis pansies in here. But we also have these ornamental peppers. And as you see throughout the season, if you harvest them, they're, there's the jalapenos that are green, but you can even leave them and they're becoming a red color Asian in there. So they can be harvested or they can be just kept for that ornamental factor of being able to see the color change that goes throughout. Here's another one um, that's been incorporated in with some flowers. So this is a shrimp plant and it also has some sedum that's in a container but we've added this dinosaur kale and it looks little right here. It's kind of to the side, but you can see as it's growing, we can still have lots of harvestable leaves that can be harvested and, and utilized by anyone. And this is up next to a house. This is next to a patio area and it can be incorporated. And this was the use of some containers that I had. We also can think about those taller elements and screening elements. So if we can add sunflowers, um, Indian corn, popcorn, you can add a height layer. You also can add a vertical element 
by this cucumber in the center, maybe of your flower bed, and just have that vertical height and still be able to, to pick that produce that's fresh. Another thing that we're looking at incorporating that most people maybe not uh, have utilized as much, but are still great edible um, crops that can be incorporated. Some of those could be your dill. Um, at, it's that, that dual purpose item of, of being not only able to utilize that with your harvesting of cucumbers, but also it's the host plant for swallowtail butterflies, caterpillars. Um, bronze fennel is another one that can be utilized. That's this second picture here. Wonderberries is one that is a solanaceous crop. Um, this is one that we'll pick these purple berries as they're ready to harvest. Um, they're ones that have multiple succession uh, of fruiting throughout the season. So you're able to pick multiple times. And another one that you also can pick multiple times would be your ground cherries. And this is what the green plant looks like. It's got this beautiful foliage on it. Um, but it's also one that you can, as, a, as it starts to ripen, it creates these husks and then the berries themselves are this yellow colored um, big ground cherries that you can utilize. So these are great cover crops that you can use in there. The big thing you want to think about though is what are your expectations are and your tolerance level to pest? I know my tolerance to pest is a little different. Um, I am willing to give up some of my crop if I know that it's a beneficial insect. Um, but if it's destroying it, maybe like this one right here, this center picture of our tomato hornworm, I'm maybe not as tolerant of those as I should be. And I know that those are a pest that can be removed and handpicked. While if I have a spider or our uh, bees or wasps, I may be a little more tolerant of those pests around the house. So you have to think about when you're incorporating your your edibles, what is my tolerance level? Because I know I'm going to bring in both beneficials and some pests um, closer to my house. And we also need to think about those that vigilance, right? We're, we're needing to be looking and identifying what happens to be on our edibles. And that way we don't have any infestations of anything. So this is a great way to look at this is, do I need to get a friend like a goat to help me with that weed management? Or is it just a matter of making sure that I am mulching, um, hand pulling some of those weeds and putting a weed suppression down? It may be a fiber or it might be a bio mulch. Um, that's down, that's going to cover some of that area. And that way, then I don't have to worry about pest or weed management throughout the season since I want it to look nice. As we're planting our edibles, though, we need to know that there's certain ways that we need to um, manage them so that we have the most benefit from them. So one of the things that we have to think about, especially with kale, um, is our uh, caterpillars that come, right? So we know that we have cabbage worms. We'll have the white butterflies and that will come along and lay the eggs. And we get the cabbage worms. Um, there are a lot of different lepidoptera uh, larvae that's going to consume our coal crops. This one may be a cabbage looper. Um, but we know that we can manage this either by identifying it, as we can see here uh, right away, we can target only this species by using, which is a caterpillar, uh, Bactylus genus. We know that that will just get rid of our, our, our you know, caterpillars that are eating that whole crop um, or that leafy green. We know that it's not going to target every insect that we have, but it's one that we can utilize and just target these pests so that they don't ruin our crop. We also know that um, we can select for lower uh, pest species. So one of those great ones, as I've kind of shown here, is our uh, use of the bright light series of the Swiss chard. Swiss chard has this beautiful foliage that's kind of going up. They also have these beautiful stems 
Um, this is an edible, but it also has different colors. So it has this golden color, it has a white color, it has this red base to it. But this is a low pest um, vegetable. It will get pests. You know, there's certain things that will come in and utilize it. But this is one that typically throughout the season sees um, less of those pests. And so that's something you can incorporate. We also want to think about rotation and timing. So rotation of our crops will also help break that pest cycle. And that will help if we're going to incorporate. So we don't want to incorporate two, like say we're going to do concurbits and we're, we're doing our squashes. Even though we might really love to put some uh, pumpkins in one year, we don't want to follow it the second year by adding another squash plant to it. Because what's going to happen is those pests, those squash bugs, or those stink bugs that are already there will come and reinfest our plants. So really putting things in that we can break that cycle and rotate our crops will help out. So as we kind of come here to the conclusion, what I want you to think about is what might we add to our landscape? Is it this possibly even this fall? Or as we're planning for next year, what are some edible elements that we can add um, that might just be a, a one or two plants at a time. But as we're thinking about it, you know, might it be that we're going to add a fruit tree to our existing landscape? Are we going to add possibly an ornamental pepper or something to our flower bed? Or are we do we need some vertical elements? And instead of using um, a windmill or a purchased item, maybe we want to incorporate an ed edible like uh, our Indian corn or our popcorn this next year. So these are all things to think about as you're as you're thinking about your edibles for next year and, and what I can incorporate. Um, I wanted to kind of let you know there, these are some of the resources that I used. Um, there is a book by um, Bria Arthur that is Foodscaping Re Revolution. Her, um, I guess her knowledge came from an HOA a homeowner association and, and how she had to incorporate in just to meet those standards. Um, New York uh, has a university le uh, urban lab farm that does a lot of this hands-on outdoor growing. Um, we have some extension blogs that is talking about edible landscape that you can go and reference if you're having some more questions. And also to think about, uh, we have our past recordings of the Four Seasons Garden Series. We want everyone to have access and, and to go to this Four Seasons recordings and, and look at things as you are having questions about edibles or any other project you're wanting to do in the future. So this is a brief survey. I'll, I'll leave this information. I wanted to kind of go to, I'll, I'll give you, this is my contact information. So again, my name is Christina Lukin. I'm the horticulture educator.